Have you ever had that feeling when it's turned cold, the sky is grey and everything is just a bit meh? And then you get a message like this. Hello John of Flying Raven Studios. I challenge you to a kit bash. Tis a Christmas kit bash. There shall be two colours in the final paint scheme, red and green, very Christmassy. It shall include at least one Christmas present. You can use miniatures from any range. It can be any size, as small or as large as you want. 17th of December is the final, and it shall be voted on by my Patreon members. Good luck. Merry Christmas. And happy kit bashing. End transmission. Oh yeah! Oh, this is gonna be good. So grab a mince pie, put up a chair next to the fire, and let's go. Okay, red and green paint scheme. Okay, one Christmas present. Minis from any range and any size. Oh, this is a very brief brief. So many options. Where to start? Hmm. Time to break out the bits box and some unused sprues. Now in here, we have a load of 40K, some Age of Sigmar, even some scale model sprues in there. So yeah, I know you lot have already seen the thumbnail, but I haven't got a clue. Now some of my favorite kit bashes over the years have been Orc Commandos from the Warhammer 40K range. As you can have loads of fun telling a story with a single model. So maybe I could go down that avenue with a commando delivering a present to his favorite Umis. For this sort of kit bash, often I would have used an Orc Knob model as the figure is bigger and gives you more scope for cutting up and adding detail. But I don't have any of those left in my stash. But what I do have is this runt herd model that has not even made it off the sprue. I won't want some of this detail like this thing that looks like a big boat mooring ring attached to his belt. But yeah, I can work with that. So first of all, let's carve that away and see where we go. Now looking at him, oh, I've just had an idea. Okay, so looking at the sprues, there are a few details which could be fun, and I'll snip those off and put those to one side for now. Now the next bit is the arms. I don't really like the runt hood arms really, so I'll try and find some others. That will fit and not make him look like a gorilla with his knuckles scraping the floor. Now these arms are from the Orc Boy sets. I think they're the ones that carry the shooters. Now the positioning is all wrong for what I had in mind, but that is fine. Now first of all, I'll need to cut away the shooter and sand it right down. Then using a pin vise drill with a 1.8 millimeter drill bit, I drill all the way through his fist, which in theory at least, I can slide a wooden cocktail stick through. So to fix the arms in position I want them, I need to pin them in place. Now to do this, I'm using a pin vise drill again with a one millimeter micro drill bit. Now I'm aiming for a hole about two millimeters deep, which should be deep enough to create a solid joint. Once I'm happy with that, I cut a small pin from one millimeter wire, which I got from a hobby shop, but you could use a straightened out paper clip if you wanted. Now this is super glued in place, and one advantage of using wire like this is that I can make any final fine adjustments by bending the wire to get the limb in the position I want. Also to make the little dude a bit easier to handle and paint, I drill another hole up through his foot and into the leg. Now this one is to mount him onto a painting handle. So this hole is a bit deeper, which is about four millimeters deep to make it more stable. Now then it's simply a case of a little bit of super glue and snapping it onto the painting handle. Now as usual, this video is not sponsored in any way. If you want to check out any of the kit that I'm using today, then I've put a full resource list with links and where you can check them out for yourself down in the description. Okay, so I have a basic model frame to work off now. Now it's time to break out the milliput. Now, if you've not seen milliput before, this stuff is fantastic for sculpting and adding details to models. It is a two part putty. And for this, I will want roughly equal sized lumps of both sticks. Now, as you can see, this is a brand new pack and it looks like they've changed the packaging to this, to this wrapper which kind of sucks as you can't keep the air out of it once you've opened it very easily. And therefore that means it'll dry up quicker. Now, once you cut off the amount you want for this bit, I'd recommend putting the other two sticks in a bag and making it as airtight as you can before packing it away. Then it's just a case of kneading the two parts together until it is all one color. 
This is a lot easier if you have some clean water to hand to keep the putty damp so it does not stick to everything. Now another top tip I heard a while back is once the putty is fully kneaded together, put it down and leave it for about five minutes. The putty will start to dry just a little bit, which makes it oh so much easier to handle and sculpt. As for sculpting tools, I've collected a various sets over the last few years, many of which, to be honest, I don't use that much. But the ones I use the most and will be using today is a metal sculpting tool set and silicon brushes. The first job is to use a small amount of putty to fill in the wire joints and where I cut away that mooring ring thingy. Now once you have it roughly right, you can then smooth out the putty and blend it in with the silicon brush and the water. Next, I want to sculpt a raggedy jacket, which is easy to sculpt by flattening the putty and simply tearing it off before using the silicone tool to smooth it into place. Now I want to keep that fur detail over the top of the shoulders, but apart from that, I carefully repeat the process all the way around creating the jacket. For his hat, as he's already giving off some Father Christmas type vibes, well, at least in my head, I decided to go the whole hog and give him a Santa hat. But if it doesn't work, I can take it off easy enough. So for the fur brim, I curled a sausage shaped lump of putty around the silicon tool to make a rough donut, then scratching the detail in. Now for the body of the hat, it was just a cone shape, which after a bit of working with the silicon tool, it doesn't actually look that bad. Now I have an overall idea forming in my head and I want to give him a big sack of um, gifts on his back. But a big lump of putty just stuck to his back may be a bit fragile. So I want to build in some support for all that weight. So before I attach that great big lump of milliput, I drill and put in two pins that will help take the weight and attach it to the rest of the model. Going through my bits box, I found this little guy, which I think I can have peeking out the top of the sack. So after cutting away the unneeded detail with my trusty razor saw, I sculpted the opening of the sack around him. The neck of the sack looked like it's being tied. Actually, this old bracelet I found in the garden might work really well. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Actually, I just found this in the bottom of the box. You may remember that I carved this off the side of the Age of Sigmar Nash Tooth when I kit bashed my beast boss on Squiggasaur. I'm actually really quite glad that I did not bin it, as it could look really good peering out of a tear in the sack. Okay, now for the present part of the challenge. What would an orc think was the best present ever? Yeah, this could work. So after cutting away the runt herd's arm from the attack squig and encasing it in milliputs, I formed that into a rough cube. Then using the torn milliput trick again, I try and make the attack swig look like it's trying to burst out of the present. Now thankfully the whole thing fits really nicely onto his hand. Next I want to create some shoulder straps for the sack. So rolling some milliput out flat onto a plastic bag so I can get it up a bit easier. Now I should be able to cut it into thin strips which I can then carefully model on as shoulder straps. Kind of blending them in where they meet into the sack. So as I look at it, the sack is looking a bit boring. So rolling the side of the metal sculpting tool over it gives it quite a nice texture. Yeah, that's better. Now every present needs a ribbon, but trying the milliput trick again was just not working for some reason and I was getting really frustrated. What to do, what to do, what to do. Ah, I wonder if this will work. So I cut off a few layers of five mil masking tape and I stick them on top of each other to make the tape thicker. And then I wrapped that around the present. Now the finishing touch was the chain, which was very fiddly. But after a bit of perseverance and some super glue, I got it where I wanted it. Okay, let's paint this guy. Already I have a range of different surfaces, such as plastic, putty, paper and metal. So a unifying layer of primer will give me a nice foundation to paint off using AK Interactive's primer and microfiller. Now in this instance, I've used a gray primer, but I want to start with some pre-shading. So the first layer is a coat of Tamiya color, sea blue, which will give it a nice deep shadow. Then over the top of that, I give it a loose kind of zenithal highlight with Tamiya color, deck tan. 
Now this helps to identify the highlights as well as pick out the detail in a warmer tone than it would be if it was pure white. Now, I'm not entirely sure why, but I always tend to start on the boots when I'm painting these guys. So a thin coat of Vallejo Model Air Black would do the trick. Now looking at it, it's gotta be a red theme for his clothes, doesn't it really? But I don't, I don't want it to be too bright and cheerful. It is the eternal war of the 41st millennium after all. So I think I'll start with this coat of Vallejo Model Air Hull Red. And also because it's such a nice thin paint, then you can easily see that pre-shading coming through. The next paint is Citadel Color Evil Sun Scarlet, but it ain't for the suit. This paint is a lot thicker, so it holds its shape when you put a slight dab in place. It doesn't flow very easily, which makes it great for the orc's red eyes when I switch out to a smaller brush. Okay, time to paint some orc skin. So to start with this, I'm gonna use a nice bright green. I know this looks very bright right now, but stay with me. Now while that dries, I'm gonna use a mid gray to paint the fur, both over his shoulders, as well as the brim of the hat. Now before I continue with the orc skin colors, I want to try out the Vallejo model color smoke for the very first time. Now this is kind of in between a standard model color paint and a model air paint. Now I have seen people use this almost as a wash or as a filter. Now this paint is from the Vallejo wood and leather effects set. I suspect I'll be using this quite a lot on this project. Okay, back to the York skin. And I'm gonna take that bright green down a chunk with the Vallejo Express color play green. As an express contrasty style paint, this paint will act as a filter for the bright green as well as adding in some shadows by letting it pool in thicker layers. Now what is good though, is that it flows into the recesses, including around those eyes, but it leaves that bright red we started with still exposed, which looks really good. Downside to this technique is that with these express sort of paints, the outcome can be a bit of a gamble compared to deliberately placing the color exactly where you want it. Now, in my experience, sometimes it works absolutely amazingly and others, it just does not pull exactly where you want it to. And it just doesn't look quite right, but we'll see how it works out today. Now, whilst that dries, it's time to add a bit more depth to that red suit. So the next step is using some Scale 75 Shrapnel Red and sketching that over the paler highlights that I can see through that whole red, rather than coating the whole thing. So you could say it is the first highlight color, I guess. Talking of highlights, now to create the highlights for the orc skin, I mix some of the light gray in with that original bright green, which strangely works quite well, especially after mixing in a tiny amount of that shrapnel red and applying that to the lower lip and onto the hands and the elbows in places. Now for the wrapping around the present, I'm not entirely sure what color to use. Although squigs are often painted red, I'm not sure I really want to do that here as you'll, you'll just lose it amongst everything else. So instead, I think I will mix some Vallejo Deep Sky, nice blue color, and some of that Vallejo Models color smoke to make a dark greeny blue, which is different enough to hold its own, yet still tie in with the overall scheme. But that then allows me to go more orangey yellow with the squigs, which should look good, hopefully. Now for the leather of the sack and the band around the present, I'm gonna use a range of paints from, from the Vallejo wood and leather set. Now this is the first time I've used this set and it will take a bit of getting used to. Now I do have projects coming up on a whole range of scales and models where I really want to work on developing the skills to achieve a realistic leather effect. So this will be an interesting journey. So if this is not your first time here, or if you just want to come and see how these projects go, then make sure you hit that subscribe button. Now next, I wanna lay down some metallics, both on the chain and on these buckles. But to do that and get the best results, I've painted them black first. Now I fully understand the irony that I'm painting a silver colored chain in metallic paint, but this should look pretty good, I think. Of course, I could just paint the iron jaw white, but that's a bit too easy and boring, isn't it? So first of all, after painting it in a mid gray, I use a slightly thinned Vallejo Model Air white and make it as streaky as I can. But I will come back to that and finish that in a minute. Now, every respectable Orc Commando will have a blackened blade in his kit. 
even if he is dressed in bright red. So for this, I use Army Painter Speed Paint Grim Black, once again, letting it pool in the areas I want as a darker color. Then using some white to pick out spot highlights and along the edge of the blade. Okay, we're getting there now. And also, as I just remembered that I've not added his staff yet, or in other words, that little cocktail stick that I primed gray right at the start, that should just slide straight into place. Yeah. Ah, this is annoying. Okay, so when I originally drilled the hole through his fist, the cocktail stick did fit beautifully, but I'd not taken into account the tiny addition to its diameter caused by the layer of paint, so now it won't fit. And by trying to force it, I'm at serious risk of breaking it. But I managed not to lose my patience with it, and after re-drilling it, I can just about fit the stick through before cutting it to length with a razor saw. Now it's back to that Vallejo leather and wood set. Now one thing I'm really starting to like about this set is that the combination of paints within it allows you to take a fairly bright yellow color. And then by using other colors in the set to add wood grain and make washes to make quite a nice effect, relatively quick and easy. Yeah, I quite like that. I think the final touch for this bit is to add a mark so those umis know who this special gift came from. Now we need something to mount this guy on. Now, I was trying to figure out a way I could have this slightly deranged Commando Santa delivering this present. I was just about to start scratch building a bunker, which for some unknown reason had a chimney, when I had an idea. But I didn't have the bit I needed. But asking around, my friend Nathan came through and in true festive spirit, let me raid his bits box for this. A spare Predator tank turret. Thanks again, mate. You are a legend. Now, Nathan had previously built it, but ended up not using it, hence why it ended up in the bottom of a drawer. But as I want to have my little festive orky dude chucking the squig through the open hatch, I need to somehow break the hatch open. I tried levering it, but could not break the joint. I even tried cutting around the joint with a hobby knife, but that kept sliding off and gouging the plastic. So developing that theme of bits, I broke out my panel scribing set. These are basically very small, very sharp little chisels. They made relatively short work of moving the glue in the joint. Yes, it's a workaround, but it works. Well, until I got a little impatient and tried to prise the joint apart when I was nearly there and snapped a small chisel in half, which was annoying. But on the flip side, the hatch is now open. So after gluing the hatch in a more open position, it is looking a bit... Yeah, I need to mount it on something so when it's on display, it doesn't look like a half finished model left on my shelf. So I spent a while digging through my bits cupboard and found this. Now this is a sort of small plastic tub you sometimes get sources in with a takeaway. Now often I use them for mixing paint or cleaning my airbrush, but if I turn it upside down and glue the turret to it, that should work pretty well, as well as giving it quite a nice stable base. So after priming it in AK primer and microfiller, now I coated the whole thing in Tamiya C blue as a base color. So I want the base to not be the focal point and black would be just too harsh. So the dark blue will work very nicely. So I ever so elegantly masked that off first before I continue. Now the challenge paint scheme has to be red and green and we already have a lot of red on the figure. So therefore a dark green, dark angel color scheme could work well for the tank turret. On top of that, I want the figure to be the bit that draws the eye rather than the base. So I'm gonna to want to keep the color scheme darker and more muted. Now to paint this, I want to try a technique which I have learned from scale modeling and I've been wanting to try out for ages. To start with, I think I'll try this dark olive green from AK Interactive. And as it is a festive wintry scene, I want this to be colder and a bit darker. So I mix this with a couple of drops from a Vallejo Model Air Deep Sky and I thin it down with a few drops of Vallejo Airbrush Thinner. Now I had a little bit of difficulty with this because obviously I'd not cleaned my airbrush as well as I thought I had. So after cleaning it properly, I slightly thinned down some of the dark olive green on its own. This time, rather than cover the whole thing, I slightly spray the middle of the panel only, not letting the paint reach the edge of the panel. I then repeat that process a couple of more times, adding another drop of white and reducing the area of the panel that I spray each time. Now that means I end up with something like this, where you have a more interesting finish that still reads to the eye as one color. Now with the middle of the panel being lighter than the edges, it's a bit like reverse edge highlighting. But I'm pleased with it for a first go. Hi, 
Editor John here. Uh, looking back at the footage, the effect is a lot more subtle on camera than when looking at it in person. So what I learned from this is that when I try this technique again, I'll be a lot bolder with a color shift. Okay, back in. So for this part of the barrel, I painted these with the Vallejo smoke. Over the green, it has quite a nice, slightly oily effect. Now between you and me, this is the first Dark Angel paint scheme I've painted. And before the Dark Angel purists jump on me, I did look into official color schemes online and ask friends with Marine Armies, but I couldn't get a unanimous answer. But it did appear that guns and weaponry in general are painted red in various configurations. So going with the rule of cool, I decided to paint the muzzle brakes with a base coat of that whole red, with a mid highlight color in the shrapnel red. Looking at it though, I'm not sure I like that. So I decided to tone it back down again with a filter of that hull red. Now before I weather this sucker up, I give it two or three coats of Vallejo satin varnish to protect the paintwork so far. So it's a bit like creating a save point. So even if I screw up the weathering completely, then I've got a better chance of getting it back to this stage to start again. Secondly, the varnish will help the paints that I use for the weathering to flow over the model better rather than be absorbed into that matte paint. Also, interestingly, with that coat of varnish, you can now see that color variations in that green a lot better. Yeah, I'm quite pleased with that. In that case, let's completely muck it up. So yes, I could make an oil wash, but I am running out of time, to be honest. So I think it's time to break out the AK Interactive Streak and Grime. Now, there are loads of shades to this stuff, but from the three I have in this set, I think I will use a festively named Winter Streak and Grime. Now this is a lot more of a greeny brown and should work well over the green of the turret. Now there are a whole range of ways you can use this stuff, from flooding the surface of the model either straight after the bottle or after wetting the surface with white spirit, then taking the majority of it back off again with a brush dipped in white spirit. Alternatively, you can put just a few dabs on and streak it out with a spirit wetted brush. Which technique you use is largely down to personal preference and the effect you're trying to make. You can also do this in layers with varnish in between to protect the effects so far. But in this instance, I'm just gonna have a play with it. Even add in a second color with the AK interactive rust streaks in places. Then it's just a case of very nervously drilling a hole in the top of the turret to take the pin glued into the bottom of the orc's foot. So, Max from Lizard of Doom, I've accepted your challenge to a Christmas kit bash. But first, let me tell you a story. A little known story of an orc. But not just any orc, no, no, no. Now this orc was a Blood Axe commando. Now we've all heard the stories of how, as a clan, the Blood Axes are fascinated about human ways and legends. Well, this commando became obsessed about the legend of the man who was so sneaky he could sneak around the planet without being seen, just to drop off surprise gifts down chimneys, despite being dressed in bright red. Maybe that is because he could move really, really fast. Don't know. But I digress. This commando wanted to be that sneaky, so decided to dress in red, just as his hero does, and sneak up on Umi's on a cold winter's night and deliver a surprise gift. And as far as the orc was concerned, what could be more of a surprise than attack squid landing in your lap? <laughs> Also, as the orc could not find many chimneys, it assumed that a tank commander's hatch would be just as fun. So that's what he did. Now thanks Max, I hope you liked it, and I hope you guys enjoyed this kit bash as much as I did. Now if you had as fun or learned something new, then please hit the like button and subscribe and share. All that good stuff, it really helps out with the algorithm. But if you want to see how this kit bash fared in the Lizard of Doom Christmas Kit Bash Challenge, I'll try and say that 10 times quickly, then you will find a link to that and to Max's awesome channel down in the comments. Now, if I don't get to speak to you all before, then I hope you all have a fantastic Christmas and happy holidays. And I hope you all get a well-deserved festive break. And I'll see you on the next project.